the question I want to start with is this. How do you know when it's time for change to happen? I just finished a whole quarter's class about Christian church history, and that took us right up to just before the Reformation. Uh, and yet, Christian history is all about attempting reformation, and some attempts succeed and some fail. There's never been a time when God's church has not had problems that needed solved. But as Adventists, we also believe in this idea of present truth. There are some issues that are relevant for certain times, uh, and certain reforms also have their time. And so as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we live in a system that we've got some critiques for. We have a few notes uh, for our church organization. That's nothing new. How do we know when it's time to press for a change? That's the issue I want to present. Oh, by the way, since I'm not sharing my screen, if you're not seeing me, if I'm just a little box, I think you might need to, on your own Zoom menu, uh, switch to presenter view uh, so that you can see my screen better uh, and you can see these visuals here in a minute. Uh, let's start with the tale of two women. About 50 years ago, Mary Kay Silver, famously sued the Pacific Press, her employer, because they had a gender-based pay scale. Now, the Adventist Church was not necessarily thrilled with this action, uh, not on official levels, but a whole lot of Adventist women, particularly those who worked for the church, cheered her on quietly. And certainly, in the liberal Adventist home in which I was raised, she was considered a hero. Something I didn't know, probably she hadn't either, was that that was not the first time that the press specifically had been investigated because of its wage scale, specifically based, investigated because it was underpaying women. Uh, the first time was actually 1888. And at that time, there's another woman whom I think of as a hero, one of my favorite women in Adventist history. I think Jim might have presented about her. Uh, I don't remember if he presented here or not for it, but uh, a woman by the yes, name of did. Jenny Ireland. He oh, did. Sorry. He did. Yeah. All right. He told us all about Jenny Ireland. Yes, she's awfully cool. But in 1888, she entered an Oakland courtroom and chose to defend the press. This, the, this presentation is uh, an adaptation of a paper that I presented for the Adventist historians meetings earlier this spring. Uh, the, the effort is an effort to reconcile the fact that both of these women uh, in their imperfect photos you can see here, uh, both of these women are my heroes and I admire them very much but they made opposite choices at the time when their stories were most in parallel. Why did one support the church and the other confronted the church? What made the difference? Well, you know, this is history. So you already know the difference is going to be, it's a different time in history. Uh, I'm going to, in the time we have, tell you a little bit about Jenny Ireland's story, since Silver's is better known. Uh, and I'm going to examine what was different in these two times that may have caused them to make these different choices. Uh, because we want to extract ideas for how do we know when it's time uh, to confront the church with reforms we think need to be made today, right? Uh, so. First, Jenny Ireland's story, and here's where I'm going to show you this full screen here, uh, and you can take a look. Okay, so Jenny Ireland was no slouch. You may remember this presentation. She was born in 1871. She was raised in an Adventist family. 
Uh, and she did some significant things for the church. She pioneered the Adventist medical work in Los Angeles, together with a friend, in the 1890s. Uh, and then in the 1900s, she planted the first Black Adventist churches in the West and pastored them herself for at least six years. She was a single woman all of her life, and she worked for the church throughout her life. Uh, she worked in the Southern California Conference Office and led multiple departments at the same time. But like Silver, her first job for the church was at Pacific Press. In fact, Ireland started working for the press when she was 15 years old in 1886. Two years later, in 1888, the press was investigated for their wage scale, and Ireland, like many other employees, went into an Oakland courtroom to testify. Uh, the investigation was different than the lawsuit in the 1970s. The Oakland Labor Commissioner had been asked to investigate Pacific Press and some others uh, because of their pay practices. There was a union for, for press workers, specifically the Oakland Typographical Union, and they were accusing Pacific Press of underpaying the employees, that is, paying them below the union standard. Uh, they said that because the press kept their pay low, that meant when they were bidding on printing jobs, they could print, or sorry, they could bid lower. Remember that until 1906, Pacific Press did what they called outside work. Uh, they worked as a press doing jobs for hire, uh, presumably to help fund the church printing needs. Other presses, the union claimed, were forced to reduce their wages so that they could compete with Pacific Press. Uh, and this meant that conditions were worse for everybody. Particularly, they claimed, the Pacific Press was grossly underpaying the women. Uh, now, I have not found this story reported in any Adventist sources, but I did find it uh, looking through uh, old uh, California newspapers in a database there. Uh, the Oakland Daily Evening Tribune talked a lot about it. It appears that the Tribune was also a competitor for printing jobs, so they had good reason to report anything that made Pacific Press look bad. Uh, the California Daily Alta said that it is alleged that the press pays starvation wages, they said, to girl typesetters and binders. Uh, and the labor commissioner, one uh, Commissioner Tobin, said that the union had actually urged equal pay for men and women, although that was not the norm in employment practices at the time. So for three nights, you had testimony. Uh, all of these are reported in the paper. And then a month, month later, sorry, the commissioner gave his report. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any legal consequences for the press, but the commissioner was not at all pleased with them. Uh, actually, to let you know how bad it is, there was also um, a, another printer being investigated was this disreputable guy by the name of Mr. Bacon. Um, and you gotta know it's bad when we're getting grouped with somebody named Mr. Bacon, right? So this other guy was known for hiring apprentices and then because they were in their apprenticeship, he would hold back like 10% of their pay. Uh, and he'd say that was insurance in case they broke their contract. Then he would mistreat the workers to encourage them to give up on him and break their contracts so he could keep the money. Uh, and then he used a whole lot of apprentice labor rather than more uh, experienced labor that he'd have to pay better. Uh, Commissioner Tobin seemed to think that the Adventists were doing not the same thing, but something similar by hiring more women and then paying them less. In fact, uh, he called it the practice of displacing men who would have to be paid enough to support a family with cheaper women's labor. And he said it was one of the crying evils of the times. 
Uh, and then I have this quote here. He says, the commissioner did, one of the officers of the association, he means the Pacific Press Association here, confessed to me that the women are underpaid. If he had added to this that as compared to the rates paid to men, the women were unjustly paid, he would, in my opinion, express the situation properly. All right, so not at all pleased with what he finds. Now, Jenny Ireland at this point is 17 years old. She's one of many press employees to testify, and yet the report in the paper for her testimony is probably the shortest of them all. Uh, others talked at length about the specifics of what they got paid or the working conditions. Now, everybody seemed to agree that the Adventist press was uh, lighter and cleaner and you got more fresh air in the building and stuff. So that was one of the things they, uh, they said was compensation, I guess. Ireland doesn't talk about any of this. She didn't even refer to how much she was paid. She just said she was satisfied with her position. Now, she doesn't criticize the church directly. In fact, right here, she's not criticizing the church at all, right? Uh, and when she gives her brief memoirs later, she also doesn't directly criticize the church. But I'm taking there some clues that she doesn't really approve. Uh, of course, I'm doing a lot of interpretation for people who aren't here to give their interpretation. But nevertheless, this is what I read. Uh, first of all, she's got a very brief testimony and she doesn't talk about her pay like everybody else does. Later on, when she's writing her memoirs, she comes a little closer to criticism uh, when she talks about working for the Southern California Conference. Uh, she says that money matters were handled badly. In fact, she said that the first conference treasurer kept no records no numbers of money received or money paid out, uh, just that when they would receive money for the conference, he would put it in a drawer. And then when somebody needed paid, he'd take the cash out of the drawer and pay them. And you can imagine this didn't result in financial stability. Ireland's own brother, John Ireland, came to audit uh, and the treasurer took off, well, didn't take off, but quit there. Uh, when he came to audit, he found there was nothing left in the drawer, nothing to pay the conference workers and not even a list of the workers who needed paid. Uh, and as for her own job, she explained that she'd led or worked in every department in the conference except the educational department, and many of them all at the same time, although she says she doesn't expect the reader to find that easy to believe. Uh, she says... Elder Reeser rather bragged about the saving it was to conference funds to have one person carry more than one department. And although she doesn't mention that her salary was also notably less than a man's salary, she does end her story with the little editorial growth wrought reform. Ireland had to know from her press experience and her conference experience that she wasn't getting paid the value of her work or even what a man would have been paid. But she worked for the church for half a century anyway. Silver and Ireland had a lot of things in common. Uh, they're both competent women who were dedicated to the church and they started working for it at a young age. They both stretch the perceived boundaries for women in the church. And they were both made aware of that unequal pay scale, the inequality that benefited their employers, but it left them on the bottom rung. But the place where their stories are most nearly parallel, the time when they each enter a courtroom, they chose differently. Ireland went into an Oakland courtroom and made a modest defense of the church, and Silver went into a San Francisco courtroom to challenge it. Now, I can't tell you why each of these women made the choice that they did. Uh, the why is always a bit of a, a slippery thing for a, a historian, 
and yet it's always the goal, right? So uh, I have, I can tell you, looking at it historically, what things I see different that could have impacted their choices. Uh, three different factors. Uh, these two women very likely were calculating the potential for change, the need for change, and also who is most at risk. All right, I realize I had skipped a slide in my visual here. Yeah, why I believe she knew better, her comments and then her reports later of what happened. All right, so let's start comparing the cases. Uh, first of all, the potential for change. I've got a, a working woman from the 1970s here, right? Uh, in 1973, what's going on? What's the potential for changing the church? Well, uh, things were changing right about this time. Now, unequal pay based on gender was technically not legal since the passage of the Civil Rights Act, but the EO EEOC, sorry, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, didn't really have any power to enforce it until in 1972, they were granted the power uh, to bring uh, lawsuits against uh, non-compliant employers or to assist employees who were suing their employers. So the Silva case is, it's a brand new thing and it's the first time uh, that they can test how far the law applies to a religious employer with a non-ministerial employee. Uh, also in the 1960s, there's the obvious change that women are in the workforce uh, much more broadly than they have before. Uh, since the mobilization of World War II, there's been an influx of women into the job market. And although there is a push after the war to try and shift things back to the way they were before, it doesn't really work. Working women are becoming a cultural norm. The 1880s are a very different story. We certainly have women in the workforce there too. I uh, dug around to find a, an image of a woman working uh, from the 1880s. But at this point, there is no law against giving unequal pay. There are certainly no consequences for the press when it's shown that they were giving unequal pay. Oh, by the way, the commissioner decided in 1888 that the um, the men were at Pacific Press were getting paid about two thirds the going rate uh, for their jobs, and women about half. Uh, all right, the union could protest. And the labor commissioner could do their, they could do their best to give the, uh, the, preset, the press bad publicity, but they don't have any authority over them. Uh, actually, the cultural expectation in the 1880s would have been on the press's side. That union policy of calling for equal pay for everybody is not the norm. In fact, Labor advocates are still working up this idea of the living wage, the idea that uh, if you work, you ought to be able to make a full living off of it. Uh, and they're focused on men. Uh, in her book, A Woman's Wage, Alice Kessler Harris documented the gendered wage philosophy of the late 19th century. Uh, and she says that advocates said that a living wage meant not just survival, it had to include things like uh, the money for warm clothing, some education, some books and furniture. And one point that all the advocates agreed on was that a living wage should include enough money to support a wife and a family. Uh, thinkers proposed everything necessary to the life of a normal man should be included in this living wage, the right to marriage, the right to have children and to educate them. Okay, that sounds great. But what about men who are single and don't have families? Well, apparently they should also get the same living wage um, so that they have the right to do all of these things. Uh, John Ryan, 
uh, who seems to be the most prolific living wage advocate in the U.S. at the time, said that single men should earn the same as married ones because, he said, they perform as much labor as their less fortunate fellows. And passing over the casual misogyny that calls the married men less fortunate, I want to point out that this ideal then is not really uh, based on what people actually need, but what they have a right to need. The men were granted the right to support a wife and family, even if they didn't. Uh, that could still be considered a need in their pay. Women were not uh, considered, even if they worked, as having the right to support themselves. In fact, uh, it's expected that if the men are actually getting a living wage, there is some man in each woman's life who is paid enough to support her, whether it's a husband or a father or somebody, some other male relative. Uh, therefore, when they discussed what a working woman should have, uh, they seem to agree that she only needs what's necessary for one human being to survive. And in fact, one labor advocate even argued that because women are used to suffering and physical privation, that they really need less than men. But it was really quite amusing to discover that one. Okay, so the church is not going to use this same language. Uh, but the needs-based pay scale follows the same pattern. Initially, uh, single men, uh, sorry, initially we have a single pay rate for men, married or unmarried, and then less for single women and much less for married women. I discovered that in PUC's early years, married women were expected to, to teach full time because everybody was needed, uh, but for half salaries. As a matter of fact, there was this thing called the family wage, uh, where if both spouses worked for the church, they weren't paid two salaries. It was more like one and a quarter or perhaps one and a third salary. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so these pay rates are certainly not what we would like today. However, they matched the progressive ideals of that time. The potential for change in Jenny Ireland's time was probably extremely low, therefore. Uh, so a different potential for change. Okay, next area, the need for change. Uh, the woman here in this picture is Sarah Halleck Lindsay. I was excited to put in her picture because for a long time we knew her name but didn't have a, a photograph that we'd identified was her. Uh, she is the first woman who had in the Adventist church who carried a ministerial license. Um, this is the the lower level license that like a beginning pastor would get a male pastor would get this and then later be given an ordained credential. Uh, women ministers and Bible workers were generally just given this, but she's the first one here. So let's talk about women in the church, uh, their status in the church as employees in the 1880s and the 1970s. Okay, so the outside world might have valued women's work less in Ireland's church, but you could argue that the Adventists, in spite of that pay scale, valued women more in the 1880s than they did in the 1970s. Why do I say that? Well, Ellen White employed and promoted this large circle of women and encouraged their placement as teachers and editors and missionaries. And of course, we had her own example since the Adventists had to actively defend her right to preach the gospel, then they had to acknowledge that those arguments could apply to other women as well. Uh, and we had many women pastors and leaders, although there's still the minority. We have Sarah Halleck Lindsay and Lulu Whiteman and Minnie Seip and many others, as well as a whole bunch of unnamed women who worked as Bible workers. And at a time when workers are scarce, the church is not highly professionalized yet. Men and women both may be trying to figure out the job as they're doing it. Women sometimes held leadership positions alongside men. 
Annie Smith would run the Review and Herald when James White was away. Flora Plummer served as the acting Iowa Conference president in 1900 and then moved on uh, to eventually lead the Sabbath School Department at the General Conference. In 1871, there's a report of the Michigan Conference choosing their three main conference officers. Two out of the three of them were women, single women, actually. Incidentally, uh, we discovered that, well, uh, it's in the same report of the same um, conference meeting where you see Ellen White being issued an ordained minister's credentials. Uh, very often we, we date Ellen White's uh, ordained minister's credentials from uh, about 1882, which is when the general conference started issuing them to her. But the Michigan conference had been giving her uh, an ordained minister's credential for a decade before that. And of course, 1881, um, that well talked over vote about ordaining women is probably the closest our church has ever come to wholesale ordination of women. So Ireland might have been treated differently because she was a woman. There's a letter in which Willie White talks about her as the little mother of her church rather than using the term pastor. But in her time, men and women commonly worked alongside each other often in similar roles. Things had changed by the time we got to the 1970s. It was an image of the Pacific Press uh, building in Mountain View, California, uh, where it was located at that time. So Roscoe Swan, in a dissertation, observes that women in conference leadership positions declined after 1905. And as conference department directors, they declined after 1915. And in both areas, there were zero women in those positions by 1950. Now, there are a lot of explanations for the change. There, we keep centralizing authority, like after 1901. Um, there's an increased status for leadership positions. So they stop giving them to lay people, and the majority of women are lay people. Uh, there is probably a reluctance to give jobs to women at a time well, such as the Depression, when um, there are a lot of men out of work. Uh, even changes in technology, which means that conference leaders, when they're going uh, visiting places around the conference, they're more likely to go by a private vehicle than by train. All of these are suggested. Uh, my favorite explanation is the one I think is the simplest. By this point, the church had grown larger. Uh, it had gotten more sophisticated. We had gone through this professionalization process. We had better education for our leaders and our ministers. And Ellen White's gone, and the church is trying to look respectable in a more and more conservative evangelical Christian world. So it just looks more respectable to have a man in charge. Plus, we have so many more qualified men to do the jobs. There's just not the same sense that the women's work is necessary. Women who did work for the church were paid less. Uh, and you know, this, this need-based pay makes sense, right? The church has never been wealthy. Uh, so it makes sense to pay people what they need to get by so that they can afford to work for the church rather than trying to reflect the value of their work since we just can't afford it. The problem with this is, although this is meant to create equality, instead, uh, it creates a ranking because when everyone's pay is low, then small differences in your pay can make a significant difference in your visible style of living. Uh, a, a small difference in pay can make a difference between whether or not you can afford a vehicle or take a vacation. And it's, it's natural, it's almost unavoidable to see these differences in our way of living as a difference in rank. Um, by the time Silver had brought her request for equal pay to her supervisor, 
there had been decades of this ranked system going on with women always in subordinate positions. And it takes a toll on the attitudes of the people in leadership. George Colvin wrote an entire dissertation uh, in 1986 about the, the Silver versus Pacific Press lawsuit. Uh, and he points out in this dissertation that the male the church leaders only female co-workers by this point are going to be secretaries or some other subordinate generally uh, and he says this meant they rarely had assertive independent women colleagues whose views had to be taken seriously and who could not be given orders so silver's request even though it's reasonable even though the church is actually started trying to move away from a gender-based pay scale at this point still it gets rejected, not just because it's impractical, uh, or uh, the press manager says, well, we'd have to pay all those other women in the bindery ahead of household pay rate, but also because it is seen as impertinent. And you can see this in some of the correspondence from that time, if you, if you read Colvin's dissertation, uh, there's one point in which uh, Richard Ott, who is the book editor there, is trying to advocate on Silver's behalf with the press manager, and he's apologetic, saying, I know that her appearance and her manners are not as pleasing as the other woman who worked as an editor before her, but try to give her something, just a little something as a token. And the fact that he has to apologize for her physical appearance says something to me when it's part of a negotiation for her wages. Okay, so I would say counterintuitively by this point, um, the, the need for change has actually gotten greater. The status of women and the respect for women working in the church is actually worse in the 1970s than in the 1880s. Uh, there's those two calculations. The last one is there's definitely a difference in who looks most vulnerable here. Who is the person who needs protection here? Silver says it's the women who work for the press. Ireland is going to say the church needs protection from the state. Here. In the 1970s, the Adventist church was already trying to change its pay practices before the suit started in order to bring them in line with the law, but they resisted being made accountable. Part of it is because Colvin says they don't seem to feel like they should be accountable to the women who work for them, but they also don't believe they should be accountable to the state. Uh, the Adventist church fought the suit based on the First Amendment and the separation of church and state, and they said they were just protecting themselves against state interference. Is that true? Well, Silver doesn't believe so, apparently. Uh, in 72, the press is actually doing quite well financially. Richard Ott, the book editor, had, editor even had the ambitions that they could expand creating books into for a non-Adventist reader market. But Silver believes the success is being built on the sacrifice of female employees. This is why she insists over and over again that she's suing on behalf of all of the women of, that work there. Uh, and she won't accept settlements for the most part uh, until she's forced to that only include herself. Uh, Leonard Bonner, the, the, the general manager, protested that he can't give her the house, head of household pay because then he has to give them to the widows and divorcees who all work in lower paid jobs there. Her ally, Lorna Tobler, the one who actually had the, the greatest legal victory in this the whole story, uh, she said that her boss, the science editor, Lawrence Maxwell, uh, uh, he had assigned her to do editorial work but paid her at the rate of a secretary because that saved money. However, when it was time to challenge the lawsuit, there was still money enough to hire a very high profile San Francisco law firm. Uh, in fact, 
this law firm was prestigious enough that Silver's EEOC lawyer felt like David facing Goliath with them. It was not so uh, in Ireland's time. What's different in Ireland's time? Uh, the challenge is coming not from an employee, but from the local government itself. And Ireland seems to believe that it's the church entity that needs protection from the state. And there's a reason why. Uh, during her time, the National Reform Association is actively advocating to enforce Sunday rest laws and to create new ones. In 1882, Willie White had been arrested and jailed temporarily because he was operating Pacific Press on a Sunday. And then there were arrests for Adventists in other parts of the US also. Uh, there's also another Protestant group, the American Sabbath Union, who was campaigning for a national Sunday law. And this guy in the picture here, this is Senator Henry W. Blair, and he would very soon uh, at least try to bring a national Sunday bill to the Senate floor. Uh, it also included a requirement for teaching Protestant Christianity in the U.S. In 1886, in response to this, that is the year that, uh, that Ireland began working as a teenager, uh, the press started publishing a journal. It was the, our very first religious liberty journal that I know of. Uh, it's called the American Sentinel. And they were publishing it right there where she was working. Although for the first 18 months, uh, they figured it was controversial enough, they wouldn't even put the names of the editors on the masthead. Uh, they kept it secret. This, I am certain, made a significant impression on 15-year-old Jenny Ireland. The Adventist community during this time was under a sense of threat and apocalyptic expectation. By the way, this was also the reason why when we have the 1888 Minneapolis uh, argument over, over the law and grace, uh, the, the old guard argue that this is a bad time. This is not the time to be advocating this because of uh, feeling like the religious liberty was under threat. The community feels like the second coming must be any time now. So to break ranks under those circumstances would have meant a very different thing than it did in 1972. So here's what I see as different, a different potential for change, a different need for change, and a different calculation of who is most vulnerable when deciding whether to support the church or challenge it. Uh, these are all significant factors. Choosing what's right or wrong in our time is very often, it, the answer to the questions are very often, it depends. Was it right for Ireland to support the press in its gendered pay scale, even though that pay scale was gonna eventually encourage the Adventist men to think less of the women they worked with? Was it right in the 70s for Silver to use the state's authority to force change in the church, even though Adventists believed that the state would eventually persecute them for being faithful to the Bible? So both Ireland and Silver chose the best thing they could with what they had available. I point all this out because we too live with the church for whom we have some notes. Uh, there are always gonna be things that need reform. They need change. Uh, we have to decide when it's time to support the church and when it's time to confront it. And the bottom line is, I can't say when it's time for any of these issues. That's kind of a God thing. But on the human side, it can be useful to examine our potential, our need, and also 
who do we need to speak up for most? That's my presentation. All right, thank you so much, uh, Laura. You've definitely given us quite a lot to think about. And I do like your perspective um, in terms of the way that you approached uh, the, the comparison. And as you said, they did the best they could um, for the time that they were in. Um, and I'm, as I said, I'm really intrigued by, by this type of history uh, because when I started working um, at, a, at a university um, in the Caribbean, so, uh, this would have been 2000 and I think about 2009, um, my colleague, one of my colleagues who was there, he was there when I was a student, he'd been there for a long time. And he shared with me that in 2000, when he started working at the university in the 1980s, uh, he did get an allowance um, because he had a family. Um, and even though there was gender reform and all of those things to bring equity to salaries, um, they could not take that away from him. So in 2005, he was still receiving an allowance because he had a family. Um, and so it's always interesting to see the complications of how you know you we approach the idea of getting to that point of equity, but we really shouldn't have that challenge in the church. Um, but I guess in so many other areas we still do. So yeah, I did find that find that interesting when I started working. Okay, Lauren, uh, you can go ahead and get the conversation started. Oh, Laura, this is fascinating. I, I, and what I, what really hit me was that uh, this is something I didn't know before. I, I thought these were just sort of default positions when they said that women shouldn't get paid. And, and it was interesting to me that there were, there were like moral arguments that they put forth to say this is, there's a reason why there's moral and social uh, arguments why they, they should do it this way, which I found fascinating. Um, I, I talked with uh, Mary Kay this morning, and uh, she said she was going to try to get on, but she was having trouble with her computer. And I don't know if, if she is able to listen. I also told her that uh, I would stream it on, on Facebook as well. But she did send me this little note uh, that I'm going to uh, read to you. She said, you know, don't you, that I was not a feminist when I worked at the press. And the whole equal pay thing would never have been an issue with me if press management had given me head of household benefits. They told me head of household was paid to the main wage earner in a family because that person needed more. So when I became the main wage earner, I asked for head of household and assumed it would simply be given to me because I qualified. So had the press equally applied its head of household policy, I would never have known that women were treated differently or unfairly. Uh, I thought that was, uh, that was kind of an interesting little um, yeah, there, there it is. Um, just to detail, she said that's often overlooked in the rush to talk about the lawsuits. I thought I'd share that with you guys. Oh, yeah, absolutely. To read the story as a story is fascinating. And I have read her book a, a few years ago, her account of it, and it's quite moving. Uh, but yeah, she's right. The, the, the church was actually trying to make things more equitable. In theory, uh, they had actually switched so that the um, single men and single women were supposed to be paid the same, but married men got a uh, a bump with all the benefits for head of household automatically upon marrying. Um, for women, I understand from uh, Colvin's dissertation that you had to ask for it and you had to prove that your spouse wasn't employed and couldn't be employed in order to get that. Uh, a thing that was not, that was supposed to be policy, but it was only applied to women, not to men asking for head of household pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, 
that I had, I had a, this was, when I was a student at Walla Walla, and this was not that many years ago, either. well, <laughs> I don't know, I guess it depends on your point of view, but I, I remember uh, there was a bit of a kerfuffle because uh, women were, uh, men were given uh, something called a curtain allowance. But if a woman was single, she wasn't given a curtain, I, a curtain allowance. And I remember one of my professors, single woman, standing up and saying, "Don't I have curtains?" <laughs> and it was it was it was uh, rather rather interesting. Oh, this is this has been super fascinating, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, see, I'll just add one more little thing, uh, Laura. So often in my years in the church. I hear this argument, and I don't know quite what to do with it. I mean, you you seem slightly sympathetic to it, but I, I probably am less because I've worked as a pastor for so many years. Whenever there's something that is kind of generally thought to be a fairly good idea, uh, church, you, you, you bring it up and say, yeah, you know, that's true. That really should be done. But now is not the time to do it. We're working in that direction. But we have to do it slowly. And we're not going to just jump in and do it. We just can't make changes like that. And I heard this when about women's ordination. I've heard this about cutting down the amount of, uh, of uh, administration that we have in the church. I've heard this about the problem of too many uh, small struggling colleges. People say, yeah, you know, that's absolutely true. We need to do this, but don't push us. We're going to do it in our own time. Well, generally, it means we're not going to do it at all. Very yeah. much so. <laughs> I've heard and that. It certainly, I would certainly say that it's not time gets used as the excuse every time, right? But when always. I teach the 1888 conflict in Minneapolis to Adventist history students, I tell them, uh, if you see something that needs change, someone will tell you it's not time. Uh, but it's true that some reforms have been successful at some times and not at other times. Um, what I'm talking about today is trying to weigh the historical factors at work that right. might make a difference. Uh, however, it can't be left up to those who have the most to lose by making a change to decide when the change is necessary. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not arguing that every change should just be rushed into, Laura. Um, I'm, just, I'm just saying that it is a convenient and very frequently trotted out excuse. And uh, it generally means we really don't want to do that. <laughs> it's hard, so we don't want to do it. It's hard, and especially if it's going to, uh, as uh, uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, Admiral Nkube wrote a piece that we put in, I think uh, last week uh, in on our website. You, you guys might like to take a look at it. Uh, he, uh, he pointed out that uh, we have, put the people who have the most benefit from an overblown church structure to be the only ones who can make the change about that overblown church structure. And the same was true of, of women. Uh, somebody had told me once, they said, the church never does, makes any change unless it is forced by a crisis into it. And uh, that's, that's a blanket statement, probably not always true, but it's usually true. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing, Lauren. Yeah, it's a, either a crisis or a lawsuit, um, which I guess is a, a crisis <laughs> um, if you look at it that way. Uh, Ron, it is time for you to join the conversation. Uh, please, let's see, go ahead and unmute. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Larry. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much, Laura, for this presentation. I actually attend to these weekly because these seminars form part of my learning experience in the sociology of religion, especially among Seventh-day Adventists in the United States where the religion was founded. And you have added 
one more piece to my learning experience. Thank you very much for your presentation, which was clear. I have a question that is bothering me and it's, it's bothering me because my, I think I'm confused as to the, about the, the name you have given me here with the, I think you said she's working at the press in the, the, the Pacific press maybe? Yes. Yeah, okay. Here's the question I want clarified in my mind because I'm not sure if I'm correct. I, I had a background in teaching before I came to the Adventist church. So I'm, I'm unlike many of you who grew up in the Adventist church. I had a learning experience. I was a teacher already, and um, waiting. Uh, in fact, waiting. I, I was a headmaster, and qualified in teaching before I become an Adventist. Um, a conference president encouraged me to become an Adventist minister because, according to him. The Adventist church, and this is in the Caribbean, needed more qualified people to be ministers. And he, he, he encouraged me. I, I, one year after that, I took up his courage and went to Jamaica, where I studied for the ministry. Early in my studies, I came across, for the first time, Spectrum magazine. And in that magazine, there was a story about, and I'm reporting the story the way I remember it, I could be wrong, but there's a story about a woman working at the Pacific Press who sued the church because her husband became sick. He also was working at the press and she had to look after him now. She stayed at the press, but they weren't paying her as a head of household. And she sued the press for um, that privilege to be able to, um, to, to, to look after him. And the short of it is that I remember very well that the president of the general conference at the time was, uh, his name just slipped me out. Uh, anyhow, he, he had to go to court. In fact, if it wasn't the Supreme Court, it's a court below the Supreme Court and made the claim that he was equal in the Adventist church to what the Pope was in the Catholic church. And therefore he made the decision that um, the, the, the church had to, stick to their, um, their, their, their rules of not paying the woman like how her husband was paid. And I had that case all in my brain forever as a Mary Kay case. Am I correct? Uh, the details, not all of them sound familiar, but yeah, it, the, the detail about um, uh, Neil Wilson, who was at the time a general conference vice president, but would become the general conference president right after going to court and making the case that uh, the Adventist church structure was hierarchical and therefore uh, the head of the church was considered something like a pope and the authority was top down. That is definitely from this story. Oh, I'm remembering Pearson. Yeah. The person I'm remembering who was the president the was court. Pearson. And he did make that argument. Now, this oh, was I see. an innovative that the Mary Kay case? interpretation of church structure, um, uh -huh. because the Adventist church, technically, it's a representative structure. And we'd say in our ah. theological statements that the authority comes from the ground level, from the local members and the right, local right, members, right, and right, right. delegated upward. Um, but you know, for the sake of, he's trying to prove that if the general conference disapproves of you, they can kick you out. No, oh. right, so it wasn't in, it, 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 it was, wasn't it, um, Elder Pearson? Because this is in the 70s. I'm remembering this story in Spectrum from the 1970s, 73, somewhere there about. Yes, that is the silver case you're remembering. The details oh, are a little okay. different. 
um, her husband had lost his job and wanted to get uh -huh. out of school. Uh -huh. um, and then, yeah, and then the church fought it because they didn't like the precedent of the state enforcing employment laws. Um, and lost. Um, so to try to disqualify her, either from the suit or at least from representing the other women, they were trying to fire her or to, to kick her uh -huh. out of the church uh -huh. uh, and trying to argue that she was not an Adventist in good standing because she had pursued the lawsuit, yes, yes, even though it wasn't yes, yes. Mm -hmm. technically against church requirements, she pursued it against church council. And because, uh -huh. you know, if the person at the top tells you to drop your lawsuit, you're supposed to drop your lawsuit. And if you don't, <laughs> that's they right, should be right, right. out of the church. None of that really accurately represented the way the church had functioned at that point, but he was trying. Laura, do, Laura this is Laura by interrupting just a little bit. Do you remember that at that very time, and I, I it's, it's, the uh, year is a little bit hazy to me, but I think it was uh, around uh, 1976 or so, 75, at uh, one of the general conference sessions, a church took a vote saying that by following the counsels of uh, the Apostle Paul, that uh, members shouldn't take each other to court, that it was therefore a sin, wrong. It is against church policy to sue uh, a uh, either a church member or the church itself. Do you remember that? Okay, so I can't say I remember it, but it was in um, in Colvin's dissertation. He examined that uh, after the, they were trying to put in a rule after the fact, I guess, to prevent future instances of members trying to hold the church accountable through the law system. Uh, and would uh sorry colvin's explanation was that it had to be altered uh at the next or within a couple of years uh because it was so so clearly inconsistent uh because it allowed the church as an entity still to sue which it has historically done and continues to do to protect what it considers its own rights uh um so i don't remember though since this wasn't the content I was specifically trying to look for, what the details came out to. But yeah, yeah. he reported that. There was, yeah. they made a change, then they had to, to go back on it somewhat. Um, but there's I don't know some that it was, it still I don't know that it was ever completely reversed, but uh, the uh, hue and cry went up saying, but you, but the general conference is right now in the midst of a number of lawsuits against some of their own employees. Uh, and uh, so now you're standing up and saying that nobody else can, can sue, nobody else can uh, defend themselves, but you can continue to do it. So yeah, I, don't, I have not heard any mention of that uh, since uh, the 70s. It, it has not been a big deal as far as I can tell. Okay, Laura, Lauren, I have a follow-up question based on what you just asked, Lauren. Um, and since Laura didn't really study that, I did, I'm not sure if she knows or if you know, Lauren. Um, was there an outline in terms of what a member should do if they had an issue with another member or with the church? You know, was there, you know, a body or, you know, what was the, the, the guideline, you know, outside of going to the courts? Well, I do know one detail that didn't come up in this, that the uh, that uh, Silver had signed saying that she'd abide by the policies, the employment policies there at the press. Uh, one of the policies was that employees uh, said that if there were disputes, they had to submit to arbitration or you know uh, the settlement of the church authority rather than going to to outside authorities such as the court. However, their working policy was never made available to Silver to read. Uh, so she wasn't aware that that was one of the things she'd signed off on to start with. And that's a whole other topic, the reluctance of church authority to show working policy to members or employees. Um, that hasn't entirely gone away. This is what I remember too, Cherry Ann, that uh, the... Uh... The, the statement indicated that you were to simply 
turn to the church authorities and trust them to help you work it out. Okay, all right. Thanks, I like thanks Gina's comment in the chat, you weren't <laughs> supposed to have a dispute with the church. <laughs> oh, wow, in a land called perfect, right? Um, uh, Alex, I've been trying to get you to unmute. I'm not sure. Unmuting is just the click of a button. As long as you give an opportunity to speak, I'm ready. Hi, Alex. Hi. Joining you from the West Coast today, just finished speaking at Berman University. I really appreciate, Laura, your presentation. It gave me additional insight. I never paid attention that it was really head of the household issue. My question is of a bit different nature. And you also shared that that was a time when Neil Wilson asserted the hierarchical structure of our church. That whole litigation was very protracted. It lasted six years until it got to the Supreme Court in 79. How come nobody from our church, how come nobody from our church challenged him as a leader on this hierarchical talk? Like, why did we just sit back and allow one of our leaders to say, yeah, we're like Catholics, I'm a Pope, and we're just dismissing uh, what we used to consider the hierarchy as terrible, now the hierarchy is good. He went on the record stating that we no longer consider top controlling everything below it as bad. How come we said nothing? How come 40 plus years go by and only now we're starting to pay attention to that? My concern is as we're looking at the big picture, could we see how some of these things develop and we skip. Like, why did nobody in the 70s challenge our top leaders of developing this hierarchical attitude that now is so dominant in our church? You ask a very good question and a very large one. Now, I understand that there was some pushback. There were some people uh, quite upset about that, but I suspect that the average uh, member wasn't really privy to what was going on. Uh, and what was being said at the time. Uh, in fact, when I read uh, official church statements about the lawsuit, like there's one in, uh, in Insight Magazine for the youth, right? Uh, and they never even mention the issue of gendered pay there. They've got a very uh, tight narrative that only says a few things and says that the lawsuit is about whether or not the state can, uh, can dictate to the church how they deal with employees, right? Uh, but you're right that we have this um, this gravitational pull to centralize authority that goes on. We had 1901 attempt to pull authority out of the general conference and localize it with unions. Uh, and since that time, it's been you know, slowly working its way back to centralization. And my guess is that that's mostly because that's what's most efficient for uh, getting things done quickly. And of course, it's most convenient. Uh, for leaders who who feel like a lot of time spent in committees with a lot of lay people is kind of wasted because they're not experts in these areas and such. Um, but yeah, more should be made of it. And uh, I'm grateful that people are talking about it now. Luckily, Neil Wilson's statements in court didn't, you know, immediately show up in church policy, but that same attitude certainly has been in place. Okay, thanks for that, Laura. Um, and yeah, I think several of us are seeing it. Um, and I see there are a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if they want to ask those questions openly um, about what we are seeing now with similar kind of approach to leadership um, in the church. But if you choose, we do need more hands. So we invite you to, to join the conversation. Until then, um, Hanel, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce your, your surname. Please let us know um, where you're from and how you pronounce that lovely surname of yours. Well, my name is Hanele, and my surname is Ochowski, and I'm from Germany, but I'm originally from Finland. Um, Thank you, uh, Laura, for the presentation. I've been very interested in this case and it was very informative. Um, there are other cases of um, discrimination that we 
don't know about, but people who have been working with these people know them. And uh, um, I just po posted in the comments um, the, um, the link to a paper written by Miriam Wood uh, in um, preparation for the Mohaven uh, conference. And uh, she um, asked the question, are our Seventh-day Adventist male leaders so insecure, so mediocre, yet so grossly convinced of their superiority that they cannot accept women as equals? And then she um, describes some incidents where um, women uh, worked as assistants for department leaders and did all the work, but were of course just paid as assistants and secretaries and the department leaders who didn't do the work were paid with all the, the benefits that they can have. Um, and, um, and these women were really, you know, working day and night at very, very uh, low pay. Um, and then uh, when some of these women found out that they could challenge this, uh, of course, that, that wasn't the thing that they, the, the leaders wanted to hear. So one of these leaders said, we will never have a woman officially doing what you are doing. Ooh. A woman will never officially be doing what you are doing. She's doing the work, but if she can't be, if she can't be called the person who's doing it. She can't be paid for it. And um, and then uh, in the end of the paper, she uh, says, uh, trying to find out what is the cause of male superiority thinking in the church is something that she wanted to, to uh, have to start the people uh, considering with her paper. Why do men feel the need to be superior? Did we lose Hanalee? In this, um, and, and is this a Christian attitude? And that, hmm? did, did you lose me? Just, just briefly. Just for a oh. moment, Hanalee. Uh, just I, go back about, about 10 seconds. Okay, my, my internet uh, probably just crashed. I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes, very yes, well. Yeah. We can hear you clearly. Uh, so, uh, so this is something that I've been trying to, to find, find out. What, what is the cause for the male um, superiority? Well, the, 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 what makes men think that they are superior uh, to, to women and why can't they accept uh, women as their equals? In pay, but also in, in, in general attitudes. And I come to the conclusion that they don't even realize that they have this superiority thinking. It's just so inborn, so so uh, transmitted. I don't know through the, through culture or whatever. So um, yeah, what do you say to that? <laughs> I say you've put it extremely well. I just uh, clicked on your link and opened it in my bet my uh, browser because I've heard of this paper and I haven't actually read it before. So I'm going to look at that later. Uh, you're right, there were a lot of women doing a lot of really important tasks for the church, and at a certain point in church history, their names start getting deleted, so that you have women writing books of theology back in Jenny Ireland's time, uh, <clears throat> women editing Adventist periodicals, and even when it's clear that they're still doing the editing, their names get dropped from the mastheads, and whatever man is in charge of that area gets credit for it. There's the case of uh, uh, Minnie Chrysler. Her husband is made uh, put in charge of the union in China. She's obviously editing the paper still, but they take her name off it and put her husband's name on it, even though he's clearly traveling and doesn't have time to edit a church paper. Uh, there, there are you know compilations from Madeline White's work, research work, books published under men's names because they were the official person in charge, um, but the research actually done by the women who worked for them. Uh, and it's got to be a function of habit eventually because we don't start out this way as a church. Uh, men and women might not get equal respect initially, but they certainly got more, they were more equal than they got to be by the time Silver is trying to to hold the church accountable to its own policy 
uh, and they believe that she's got a bad attitude and she should just trust the men to make the right well, choice when they want to. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, as long as Ellen White was alive, um, it was a different uh, question. And and even, you know, James White and, and Uriah Smith and all these guys at the Review and Herald at the time, they would uh, write uh, about the right of women to preach and, and so on. So, so once she died, we didn't need the women anymore. <laughs> Right. And we had this education system. We had very well qualified ministers. The evangelicals were getting very conservative. Fundamentalism was going on and we started to adopt some of their gender attitudes. That, uh, and then it shows up anytime there's an advancement for women, the conservative Christian sphere has a pushback. Uh, like after World War II and such, uh, there's a, a pressure to try and keep women back in traditional roles, even though they've had expanded roles in society. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Hanley, um, for that. And now, Jerry Craig, uh, it is time for you to join the conversation. Okay, thank you, Laura. That was an exceptional presentation. Thank you so much for that. I just thought I'd add a little bit from my personal history. When my mother was hired, I think it was in 1964 to go to Andrews. My father was much uh, older and retired. She asked for and got head of household benefits then. So obviously there was no church regulation that it couldn't be given to women. It just never was unless there were certain conditions. And I wasn't old enough to really know if she demanded it or she wouldn't come. Probably not because she was working for um, Fletcher Nursing School. So she probably made less there than she would at Andrews. But she did ask for it and she got it in 1964 when she went there. Thanks. That is a really cool story. Yeah, the pay scale had been designed, it, it had at least been amended so that it seemed to be based on need, but it wasn't applied necessarily in a way that was, was based on need. Uh, so that there was a, a discrepancy in applying it, like men automatically getting that head of household pay and benefits when they married, um, but women needing to prove that their husbands weren't working and couldn't work to get it. Okay, thanks for sharing, Sherry. Uh, Janet, uh, please go ahead and join the conversation. Thank you. I would also like to add a bit of a personal historical note to this discussion. Um, my father worked for Maracle Press, which was loosely affiliated, I'm not sure exactly how, with Pacific Press in the United States. Maracle Press is in um, Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. And um, they printed a lot of Adventist material. Uh, it was not unionized, but they also did uh, commercial work as well. My mother, uh, became uh, or was a school a church school teacher and when my youngest sibling there were seven of us and I was the oldest uh, started school my mother started teaching church school again at that same time I was starting Andrews University and from for the next few years all of my mother's church school salary went to help support us. We worked as well uh, at Andrews University, the first four of us kids. And then along came the Mary Kay case. And as my mother said, uh, who died a few years ago at the age of 97, she said, uh, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Mary Kay. She said, because when the first four of you went to Andrews University, there was no, I didn't have equal pay with men in the church school, other teachers. And she said, I didn't have access to an education allowance. But when Mary Kay became um, 
when her case was settled, then my mother got equal pay, which made her, my, her uh, salary go up. And as well, uh, she was able to get the education allowance for the last three of my siblings who attended Andrews University. And it made a huge difference to our family uh, financial situation. And so that's just, um, just that uh, if Mary Kay happens to be hearing this or if somebody can pass it on to her, um, there were many women who, um, who applauded what she did for us. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for that story. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Parents, uh, it is now time for you to unmute and join the conversation. Hello, is it me? It, is it I? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Laura, for the presentation. And um, I hesitated a while to ask the question because it's going to take us away from the social to a more, well, Theological, let us call it, call it by sleep, <laughs> Pres uh, section. But uh, just as an introduction, it seems to me that the church certainly has been discriminatory toward women in not paying them a fair wage. But it is also true that the church does that for to everybody. And I've always asked myself the question, why is it? that as church workers, we are paid so little. <laughs> the church simply says, well, you are given a missionary salary, but yet, when you go to a supermarket, they don't ask you whether you have a missionary salary. You have, you have to pay as everybody else does, but the church insists you get a missionary salary and uh, generally, Maybe that's not that it's not the case in the United States, but in my section of the world, in the Caribbean, generally ministers at retirement are reduced to the lower, how you call it now? The lower middle income bracket. We are not in the poor section, but we are almost there, just a little above poverty. That's the way it is. And I've always wondered why does the church do that? When we have all kinds of departments, we spend money on all kinds of things, but when it comes to giving the people who do the work a fair living wage, we just don't do it. And we talk about a missionary salary. Well, that was the introduction. My real question is this. You began the presentation asking a question. When is it time to change? How do we know it is time to change? I ask myself the question very often. This morning I listened to, uh, well, partly listened to a Sabbath school presentation. They were discussing all over the, the place, all over the internet and everywhere else. They were discussing Babylon and uh, what it is again. And Babylon is fallen and so on and so on and so on. And of course, Babylon is uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And Babylon began with Nimrod. And well, you know the whole story. And I was saying to myself, when will we cease from these things? When? To begin with, Babylon didn't begin with Nimrod. That is what the Jewish writer says. But all other historians, and all other writers and archeologists will tell you that Babylon has been there for donkey's years. It didn't begin with one a person called Nimrod, that Nimrod got Babylon and Eric and everything else in the land of Shinya. We have, we take, a, the world takes an evolutionary view of these things and that is correct. There is no denying it. So, when will we cease to speak like this? And when will we update our way of thinking and update our theology? 
I put the question to Laura. <laughs> Please give me an answer. Well, uh, I'm not sure that there's a great answer for you. One of the things that I can say from the study of history is that the more time goes on <clears throat> and the larger the church grows, the more difficult it is to change or update anything. Uh, our processes that try to create representation also means things move very slowly, which is another reason why we have the, uh, <clears throat> the levels of the church trying to consolidate power and centralize to make things more efficient because we're just such a large group. Um, change, yeah, change is painful, it's slow, it's not always wanted, and I think that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the way that we pay people as a church, uh, I will hold firm that the church has never intended to, uh, the discrimination is, was never the original intent, and the we pick up things and we, we start policies because that's what makes the most sense to us at the time, uh, and then we kind of get locked into them as well and we're not always we don't always hold ourselves accountable to the the outcomes of it like having that living wage made sense at the time um, but it brings with it a host of social um consequences no of course that the church doesn't unless forced to doesn't deal with because we did what was sensible and then we had to move on to worrying about other things um I'm told, Laura, that the um, I was told so. I'm not a I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know these things, but I was told that the medical personnel, especially doctors in the Caribbean, especially or and elsewhere, I suppose so, finally rebelled. Well, rebelled within inverted commas because they said, "Well, we are doctors." And when we meet other doctors, they are at a certain level. And we are poor doctors. And so they insisted that since they are medical doctors, they ought to be paid as medical doctors are paid everywhere. And they insisted on that. And finally, the church made a change in its medical institutions. I hope I heard correctly, but that is what I heard. You are correct Whether on that. I did some searching for the first iteration of this research about just Adventist pay in general. Uh, and there was much discussion about the Adventist wage scale and the theology behind it at that time, because uh, there had been an attempt for some time to keep the medical and ministerial work on the same pay rate so that there could be equity within the church. Uh, eventually that, they gave up on that because it's really hard to staff a hospital full of medical personnel if you can't pay anything close to what they can pay, uh, they can earn at another, with another employer. Uh, and so that was taken off of the, the, the medical personnel off of the uh, wage scale that the rest of the church adhered to. Uh, and so then there was a great deal of discussion about uh, why should we be paid at this rate or that rate and and what's important here during that time, which was very fruitful for understanding the Adventist attitudes about having that compressed and similar pay scale. Yeah. You know, in the French system where I live, there is a general governmental policy and there are trade unions to push for its implementation in case anybody slips, which says simply that as inflation goes up, well, the, wage, the wages must go up, you know? Inflation goes up, the wages go up so that people ought to be able to live. And in our system, it just doesn't go that way. They just keep, <laughs> even now, I'm retired, so it doesn't, I'm not directly concerned. But as I inquire as to what is happening with my colleagues still in ministry, they are just a little above the poverty line. It's always like that, just a little above. Even when they are department heads, well, they get a 1%, a 2%, even a 10% increase, but they will end up in being just above poverty all their lives. 
That is the reality of the situation, simply because, well, you're living, you're working for the Lord. And because you're working for the Lord, and then you're supposed to be poor. Yeah, and <laughs> I agree. The issue of Adventist peace well, is another minute. whole area we could go into and probably deserves attention just by itself. Did you say you agree? To what do you agree? <laughs> I agree <laughs> that it, the, the issue of Adventist pay scales and where they're set and how they change and such are, it, it's a big issue and deserves its own conversation. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Clarence. Uh, definitely appreciate your perspectives, um, your experience, um, and some of the, the questions uh, that, you, that you've raised. Definitely uh, could be, as you said, Laura, a whole other conversation um, around that, and we could pull that into that conversation. Um, those of us who volunteer our services for the church and how much time it takes, um, but you're expected to volunteer um, for the church because it's for the church, right? Uh, but that is not today's conversation. Marco, please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for your presentation. Um, this comes uh, after I've held in one of my small churches as a pastor. Uh, we held a, a very honest talk about Babylon and uh, basically the spirit of Babylon and uh, how it is presented in the in the Sabbath school lesson. It's so sectarian um, and uh, it doesn't concern the spiritual side. How? how one church becomes, you know, the, 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 the pure church becomes, what's the process? And then people were, you know, thinking about that. And uh, of course, uh, I'm the one who is doing uh, the, the thinking for, for, you know, I'm paid for that, about these stuff. And, and I say, well, behind that all is uh, how you manage power. When you get in the position of leadership, that's when you get the power and then, uh, it's not about the doctrine. It's not about you know anything. Uh, it's presented as 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 a, as a doctrinal issue, but uh, you know uh, Pharisees, Jews didn't have any doctrinal issues, and they still managed to to you know uh, crucify the Lord. So uh, you know the doctrine is not what what is the the main thing. And then the question that the answer is is basically where does the the, the corruption come from it it comes from character it comes the, from the person who holds the power not what he allegedly believes you know subscribes uh, you know uh, to believe but uh, it's about the character of the person and that's something that i think we as as the church are very poor at producing we're not producing good characters we're not producing martyrs we're produ producing professors and we're producing you know leaders and when you give them power <laughs> you're ashamed of what you see and uh, to answer hanel's uh, uh, question when she asks uh, uh, why men you know do that why are they so intimidated and you know of women and uh, my answer is those are not men okay those people are not men they are an excuse they, they are genetically men but they are not in character they are not men you know when they co compete with women you know it's just pure cowardice Cow cowardice and and uh, I don't know. Um, I think we should uh, we should define what actually man is in terms of character, in terms of spiritual uh, position. Uh, what are those qualities? Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are. They think if they do. Uh, masters in leadership, did they become leaders? No, no, they're not leaders. Uh, they're just, you know, uh, you know, because leadership, leadership is about character. Leadership is not about knowledge. Uh, usually those who, you know, go to leadership classes, 
lot of them, I don't say every, everybody, but they want tools to manipulate. That's what they, they are after. Um, and that's why they're, they're managing these situations poorly. Um, because they are just weak in, in personality, not in knowledge. So yeah, a lot of, you know, I think when they, you know, uh, uh, um, treat me, women like that, they feel threatened, that's the sign that they are very, um, they're incompetent. And then they, they, they feel threatened by, by the work they're doing, not by the, you know, uh, and gender is just excuse. It's just cheap shop. That's it. Thank you. Sorry for, uh, I, I, I'm just ranting because I'm, I'm just fed, fed up with, with these poor excuses for, for men, you know, uh, walking around and, and, you know, pretending they're leaders. It is just, sorry, sorry. Thank you for this opportunity to share. <laughs> you don't need to apologize. Uh, I listened to what you were saying, and you make an important point that that abuses of power are very often justified on the basis of, basis of doctrine or conviction, but they really boil down to issues of character. Uh, and that as a church, we should be focusing more on training character, personal integrity, uh, even more so than training one's doctrinal perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, or even one's skill set. This is wise. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, just to make a co another comment. I think Ellen White's effort, entire Ellen White's effort is not to educate people, but to train their, you know, on a level of character. That's, that's her entire, entire ministry, basically. Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. Yeah, thank you so much um, for sharing, Marco. And don't worry, you're in a safe space, so you can run away. Uh, Carmen, it is now time to join the conversation. Hi, uh, Laura, thank you. I appreciate your scholarship so much. It's so important. Um, I wanted to just start with uh, the email from Mary Kay, where she said, I didn't start out as a feminist. And I thought that was so significant because it's not that women start out perhaps as feminists, it's suddenly when they become aware <laughs> that there are these issues. And then when they want justice, then they get dismissed as being feminist. So it's sort of this, you can't win. Um, but I wanted to bring up uh, one of the points you made about how the church defended itself on the basis of the separation of church and state. Uh, which apparently didn't work when it was the press, but we keep seeing that issue. Um, it's kind of what's used for not recognizing women through ordination now, um, at least in the United States. And it seems like that's what's being used when we don't recognize the challenges that some of our European unions face when their governments do require their employees to be recognized and treated equally. But I also find it, and, and this is really kind of a sidebar to, the, to today's topic, but it's the separation of church and state, where I think we, we put it on quicksand when we use it, and we have, along with some other churches, to defend not treating employees equally, like our teachers and terminating them for reasons that secular employees are protected um, under. And I just think, first, we're not respecting separation of church when we do that, and that we're just setting ourselves up for future problems. And I'm so sad when I see it being misused that way. Yeah, well said. Uh yeah, the, the primary question for Pacific Press and those defending it seemed to be who has the right to hold the church accountable, uh, right? Um, they didn't believe the women had the right to hold them accountable. 
uh, because they were lower status employees and they didn't believe it was legitimate for the state to hold them accountable. So uh, the remarkable thing here is that, that, yeah, the church was already trying to make adjustments so that they could make their head of household pay system uh, not gender discriminatory so that they could make it comply with the law. And yet, when the law stepped in and said, well, there's a problem here and you need to change, they fought it uh, instead of instead of fixing it. That was already the plan. Uh, and it's the question of whether or not anybody can hold the church accountable. That's what I think is at the heart of the separation of church and state defense uh, and the arguments the underneath that though are mm -hmm. we claiming don't get in the way of us exercising our beliefs because we do believe that we should treat people unfairly based on race or gender or whatever i mean that's when we use that claim that's what we're yep. saying that is the catch there because they couldn't there's an attempt to say that this pay scale is based on conviction uh, in well, fact Neil Wilson says in court that this is based not on uh, the custom that ev what everybody else does, it's based on uh, our beliefs. He says that in court, and yet it's also the way everybody else used to do it. And looking historically, it looks like that was just adopted for practical reasons, not theological ones. And yeah, we get into really terrible theological territory when we say, oh no, this is, we have to be protected because it's our belief that we should behave this way. Uh, it's not really, it seems to be simply our conviction that we shouldn't be accountable to the government. Exactly, agreed. Thank you so much. All right, thanks so much for that. Carmen. Um, Ed, please go ahead and join the conversation. Good afternoon. Uh, just a comment before I get into the main thing I want to talk about. It was a terrible moment in our church's history when both Robert Pearson and Neil Wilson gave depositions in the Mary Kay Silver case that asserted that the church is hierarchical. Uh, they just completely overrode the structure established in 1901, which clearly provided separation at the union conference level uh, between them and the GC. And I think we have paid for it ever since because they started to believe their own story and have been ever since then been pursuing making it real. And uh, it, it's one of the biggest underlying fights in the church, I think, but I'm not sure there's much fight. Uh, the people that should be fighting, who have the legal standing to fight because of our structure, are the union presidents. Um, but that's, forgive my brief rant. Um, I want to go back to, uh, Laura, the start of your presentation where you talked about change in the church. Uh, could you remind me just exactly what it was you posed uh, at, when you started? I was trying to suggest that we all know that the church needs change, right? The Christian church has always needed change and, and reform. Um, but sometimes reforms succeed and sometimes they don't. If I pair that with the Adventist idea of present truth, the idea that there are some things, some issues for certain moments in history, uh, then perhaps we can say there's a time, a space when now is the time for this reform. And uh, as we assess the faults of our church, uh, and, and decide whether we need to stick with it and just deal with it, or whether we need to try to uh, confront and challenge the problem, we're asking a question of time. Is this the time to do it? And I'm not going to pretend there's an easy answer way to know the answer to that, but this is how I think these people were assessing whether this was their time or not. Yeah, well, it and it's... 
I think it's a question for our day as well. I mean, after all, uh, Mary Kay Silver case was what, 1979 and 80? It was resolved, I think, in 80, um, something like that. Uh, that's over 40 years ago. Uh, we're probably, it's time for change in certain ways now. I think it would be interesting for us uh, to jump to the big picture question of what do we need to change now? Uh, There's some stuff. I'm, I'm certainly convinced there are things that we need to change, uh, things that uh, I think be between at least some of the church membership, the fellowship of the body of believers and the, the bureaucracy, that there are growing gaps. Uh, and uh, people don't know how to get a handle on the issues of change. Uh, it's extremely difficult to change this organization just because of the way things are constructed. Uh, the, the nature of the linkages between different uh, bodies of the church. Um, I, I, I personally feel like we need some theological change. That uh, we may. Uh, we need some theological change that some of our theology really grew out of an obsession with 1844. That was 180 years ago. And a lot of the things we said were going to happen haven't. They just haven't. And uh, so I, I'm just wondering about theological change. I'm certain we need organizational change. Um, but you know, it's, as it's so difficult to make change in this body, one reason it's so difficult that people don't often think about is us. It's the our constituency structure and constituencies are notoriously reactive uh, when they meet in their every five year sessions. Uh, and so the bureaucracy structure makes it difficult to change things and constituency makes it difficult to change. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you just want to throw your hands up. Um, from my consulting experience, uh, I identified what I thought were the two hardest kinds of entities to bring about meaningful change in. The first one is a church. Because a church tends to throw a mantle of rightness or righteousness over everything. Everything becomes rooted in good and evil somehow or other. The second thing that's hard to change, uh, I know there are several of you that are educators, is the education establishment. We're big in both of those, by the way, education and church. Uh, and they're both very, very difficult to change. So kind of my thinking these days is meaningful change in the Adventist church may have to happen organically where I'm changing, you're changing, we're starting to drift toward maybe common perspectives on where the, what the future should look like. And uh, so I don't know, it may happen more at the, uh, or shall we say congregational level, the membership level, um, but I'd be interested in your take on what you think needs change and how change can be brought about? Do we have to be like Mary Kay Silver and go to court? Well, a lot of things in our church aren't litigable, if that's a word. You can't litigate them. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank and you so U.S. courts are, uh, are very reluctant to uh, take on litigation against churches because of the, you know, the questionable legal area in there. I know. Uh, I sometimes wonder if we're very much crippled by the fact that in 1901, we had this dramatic change, right? 
uh, there was a financial crisis leading to it, and everybody knew that there was a need for dramatic change. And yet, when the delegates came to the general conference session, there was a full agenda of normal stuff to do. We, we're so busy, it's hard to do important things because we're so busy doing immediate things. Uh, and it took Ellen White. Uh, they said, would you like to say something? And she said, no, I, I don't want to say anything here because I have too much to say. And then she went on and spoke for an hour and a half, right? It, that was her hold me back statement. Uh, and we don't have this anybody who is the same heavy hitter in the way that Ellen White was to force people to confront change or the need for change. And the bigger we get, you're right because our systems are designed to make it difficult to create change so that there will be measured change, but they move slower and slower the larger we get. I don't feel prepared to weigh in on a list of things that I think currently need to change, because I think that would take some thought. Um, however, I have observed to students that Going along with what you said, there are two ways that you deal with a broken system. Well, there's probably more than two ways, but you can try to confront the system or you can bypass the system. And eventually formal changes often come because people were bypassing the system and the reality just kind of changed underneath the leadership. And then you have to make some adaptations to keep up. And that's probably the more hopeful source of change in my opinion but i had i had some comments um lauren had asked me to raise my hand because he knows i'm a feminist <laughs> uh, so i wanted to share a story that happened just to let you know that it's not just the adventist church that has this problem when my youngest son was attending um a preschool uh in palo alto california it was uh on the grounds of a nazarene church that had kind of relabeled or ca called itself a non Nazarene name, but they were the ones running the church. And there was a pastor there who used to give like little Bible stories to the children. And he would just hang around the, the preschool all the time during the week. Well, he took it as an opportunity to harass the women who were working there. So he would go into the kitchen and say, oh, we're having chicken today. Oh, you know, I really like the breasts and thighs. They're my, I mean, just sleazy stuff. And he would make uh -huh. comments about parishioners and the clothing that they wore and how they were revealing body parts and showed up at this one woman who had recently divorced, showed up at her house at 11 o'clock at night. She was one of the teachers there and brought her a Victoria's Secret catalog and told her he'd like to see her in some of these um things that were in Victoria's Secret because his wife just wore a flannel nightgown and I mean it was just totally out of line it was totally out of line so I got involved in this only because the director knew I was an attorney and asked me what they could do because they were sick of the harassment and the the church leaders were doing nothing about it so I took their stories and kind of compiled what they all had to say and and it was just outrageous what was going on so i met with i requested and met with someone who would probably be the same as a conference administrator and he came and talked to me and and said that he was going on vacation in a couple of weeks and he really wasn't going to be able to do anything until he got back from vacation. And so I told him that there was a deadline running with the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that if he didn't do anything, I would be advising the women that they should go file a claim. And then we could settle it down the line if he couldn't do anything now, but that it needed to stop now. So he went on vacation and did nothing, just letting you know that, you know, kicking it down the road and, and just hoping it goes away is not, exclusive and ad exclusively Adventist position. So they went and filed their claim with the EEOC. And then what happened was interesting. The church decided to sell the preschool for a dollar to a friend of the pastors who bought the, the preschool and then proceeded to interview all the teachers and was asking during interviews, was this one of them? Meaning who went to the EEOC and they were all fired. All the women who had filed the claim with the EEOC were fired. 
And so they had to go back and, and file a claim of retaliatory firing with the e Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And ultimately, the church was sanctioned. They had to pay fines. They had to post something in all conspicuous places saying that they had discriminated against women in their hiring policies. And the women got their, their jobs back. And this pastor was moved on to another church where I'm sure he harassed other women because the church leaders didn't seem to mind that that was a problem. And I guess I'm just telling this story because it's not exclusively an Adventist problem. It's something that has to do with um, faith tradition and are we operating in good faith? I just think I, I'd heard that down the line in the 2000s that the Mary Kay Silver uh, Silver case was discussed at a forum in Southern California, and ultimately the church said, "Well, we feel that because we're a church body, we have the right to discriminate; that the rules didn't apply to us." And I, I maybe that's how the church justifies what they did, but I don't think that's a very savory answer to the women of the church or even men of the church who are right thinking individuals. And it seems to me that the question we need to ask is, is the church, the Adventist church, the Nazarene church, the larger Christian church, are they acting in good faith when it comes to all of its members, when it comes to men, when it comes to women, when it comes to people of color, when it comes to widows, when it comes to orphans, when it comes to divorcees, when it comes to the LGBT people, are we acting in good faith? And if we're not, why would anybody want to join your church or be involved in your ministry or your church if you're not acting in good faith? That's all. Well, I want to first say how much I admire you for your for your representing them uh, because accountability, you're right, is so important. And when the church denies uh, the legitimacy of accountability, uh, they're claiming that being a religious institution gives them a lower ethical standard than everyone else in the world, uh, which is not something that we should probably say out loud, let alone mean. Um, it's amazing, isn't it, that when the church does evil, the evil is so much more evil because we claim the prerogative uh, the, the authority of God to do evil. Uh, I, I make a speech at the end of my church history classes you know, about the elves and the orcs in the church. Uh, and, and I talk about the idea that I stick with the church even though it's done such bad things. Evil done in the name of God is so much more evil I do that because the opposite is also true. And I still believe in the potential of the church because the good done in the name of God is so much more good. Uh, and we have to hang on sometimes to not what the church is, but what it can be uh, and make our part of it. So I'm grateful for the part that you play, Gina, uh, and others. We all have stories about nasty things that have been done in the name of God. Uh, I'm glad for the privilege of being able to be part of some of these better stories. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for your courage, Gina, and thank you for sharing. Uh, Gerald, please go ahead and join the conversation. Thank you, Sherry Ann, and, and thank you, Laura. You summarized what I want to say, and I'll get to it in a moment. But this morning, I, I still teach a youth Sabbath school class at my ancient age. They still ask me to teach, and I ask them to think about things. This morning's discussion surrounded the text where Matthew, the publican, the tax collector, the bad guy, holds a big feast. Jesus is there, and the friends of Matthew, the ne'er-do-wells, the misfits, the, the bad guys, come in, and the Pharisees are whispering to Jesus' disciples, saying, you know, your teacher is really putting up a really bad image by associating with these people. And Jesus overhears it and he shoots back at them. He says, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. And he quotes this text. He says, I'm after mercy, not religion. Isn't that what we're talking about here? 
we use religion to defend all manner of evil, and we feel so gratified in stance that we take. But Jesus addressed this a long time ago when he said this. Um, I say to many of my patients, and I'm a family doctor, and I ask every one of them, who are you as a spiritual person? And many of them come back with, I used to be, and they tell the story. And I apologize, and I say, religion at its worst is where one man makes another do something he would never consider doing, using God as the stick. And isn't that what we're talking about here? I'm embarrassed for what we've done. It's, it's time we change this. Yeah, that was a good commentary. I don't, I don't have anything I feel I need to add to it. And that's that's quite fine. You don't have to. Uh, Karen, so I'm gonna try to get a few other persons in. So I'm gonna go to Bob Johnson. Um, uh, Dr. Johnson, please go ahead. Is this my turn? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, Laura, your your presentation was uh, stellar. Excellent history and excellent theology, and many uh, many good insights. Um, the question of change. There are different kinds of change. In the case of uh, church change, especially in the United States and in other countries also, it's complicated because you have two players. You have the church and you have the government. And the government and the church move at different speeds. In the case we're talking about, the government moves a lot faster than the church, and the church kind of is forced to catch up. But putting complications like that aside, and this may be a bit of an oversimplification, but I hope not, uh, there are two kinds of change. There is change that occurs incrementally, and there is change that occurs by revolution. Um, the change that occurs incrementally is usually driven by societal change and is fairly painless and often so slow as to be not really visible. People don't realize that it's happening until they look back and see how things were 60 years before. The change that occurs by revolution is painful. There's usually a lot of human debris and uh, there are winners and losers. So one is driven by society, but because of that and because of its invisibility, we, we don't, we're not really uh, very intentional about the nature of the change. It, it happens in spite of ourselves. Now, uh, an example of what turned out to be an attempt at change by revolution would, was uh, Desmond Ford. By raising the issue that he did at the time that he did and in the way that he did, he actually brought back to life the doctrines that he was trying to uh, um, put in the back burner. They were already on the back burner and he brought them to life by opposing them. That's the way it sometimes happened because you, when you, when you try to change by revolution, you win or you lose, and you might lose. I wonder if uh, change by incremental uh, processes can be controlled to the extent that it might be a better way to go. I'd like to hear your comments on that. First of all, I always love hearing you talk, Dr. Johnston. I remember you from seminary. Uh, and you're right in your categorization of how change happens, that there are multiple processes. And I would add to the change by revolution uh, seems to also never create complete change. Because looking at Adventist church history, any of the issues that the church has thought about openly are with us in some sector of the church today. This is where we get um, like, um, what is historic Adventism, 
the 1888 measured study committee and then things that we fight over if we fight for something we adopt it into our identity and it kind of sticks with us and so uh there are fights that the church has had that they just continue to have they just kind of get pushed off to the side um and honestly i i don't know that i can say that absolutely one form of change is better than the other uh, because the incremental change is almost always urged when somebody proposes a dramatic change, saying we are changing, but it's going to happen slowly, which is probably true. Um, I think that, and also in the Ford case is, is a really great example too, because I understand that some of the theologians were quite upset that he brought it out openly because they believed the church was changing incrementally. It was kind of dying from lack of attention and of the issue uh, about the investigative judgment uh, and the connection to 1844 was suddenly in the forefront and people were suddenly defensive of it because of that. Uh, interestingly, Ford was overheard to, to say as he's getting ready to walk up to give his controversial presentation, it's time. Uh, he was convinced that the church was ready for this and that that it was just this was the moment in history. Uh, incremental change is good when you've got social factors that can drive it along, uh, then it can be less traumatic. Um, but I think incremental change can also be used as an excuse, uh, the, the promise that it's going to happen uh, when it may or may not happen. And I feel yeah, I'm more comfortable with from with um, advocating for incremental change, and I'm chastened by the words of civil rights activists who say the urge for incremental change means people are comfortable with leaving things as they are. There may be some problems that are problematic enough that they are worth the pain of a revolutionary change, and there might not be. I can't say that I'm qualified to say which is which. <laughs>